Hello, hello. Welcome to another Hometown Daily News Show. This is for November 27th, 2022. It's titled Roaming Monkeys, Romanian Coins, and Roman Sausage Dogs, and more news. Hello, and welcome to another Hometown Daily News Show. I am Mayor Watt. That is hometown.com. <laughs> and um, today is Sunday, November 27th, 2022. It's episode 331. I've not missed a day yet. Monday might be the day that I am really, really late, or I might miss it. Not sure just yet, but we'll see. I've already selected a bunch of articles. Let's get right into it. One thing you should know before I do get started is that you can go to hometown. There's a little link right there. Hometown.showbot.tv. That's right, showbot. And uh, you can vote up or for articles that you find interesting. We'll just go from there. First article is seven CEOs on the innovative and timely books. Everyone should read this, this uh, winter from inspirational nonfiction to deep dives on the latest trends in business. Consider these titles to expand your reading. So this is from uh, CNBC. Not sure what's going on there. And um, it's by Morgan Smith. Again, CNBC.com. They have a section called make it, I guess. And um, one of the article or one of the uh, books is principles for dealing with changing world order. Why nations succeed and fail. Think again, the power of knowing what you don't know, which is, well, <laughs> you don't know what you don't know until somebody introduces that unknown to you or you stumble across something that triggers the need to find out about the unknown unknown starting to sound like a politician think again the power of knowing what you don't know so go and check that one out uh, embrace the work love your career and this is a a book here that says it's um last year when they received the advanced manuscript for embrace the work love your career they immediately found the book innovative there uh, that, that she encourages the reader to foster evidence-based confidence to cultivate their own self-assurance <laughs> Evidence-based confidence. You mean success? Okay. So leadership and self-deception getting out of the box. The quote here is, we've all heard that being a better listener is the hallmark of a good leader and business owner. This book is a quick read that really helped them. The Recommended by Timothy Chi, CEO of The Knot Worldwide. Help them connect in ways... Uh, we tend to tell ourselves stories to self-justify their thoughts and actions, understanding how we can make or we can be more self-aware about our own innate motivators as well as those you're interacting with. Interesting. Okay. The Emerald Mile, the epic story of the fastest ride in history through the heart of the Grand Canyon and a guide to the good life, the ancient art of stoic joy. That's right. Be happy regardless. Guess you could do it. And um, Mark Bittman is a, uh, wrote a book called Animal Vegetable Junk, A History of Food from Sustainable to Suicidal, recommended by Geneva Long, founder and CEO of Bolus. It says, uh, on its face, this book is about humanity's relationship to food. Um... That's pretty expansive, but you can go and check out these books. Seven CEOs on the innovative and timely books. Everyone should read this winter. Again, it's by Morgan Smith over at CNBC. And let's move on to the next article. If you're curious about all of these articles, there's a link right there. I'm not sure how well it's coming out on the stream on Twitch. Um, I know that when I blow it up bigger, I can see it pretty well, but my monitor basically shows it as 
well, if I look on my other monitor, I see it just fine. So if you are in my chat and you are looking at uh, the stream and that see that little link down there, let me know if you can read it really well. I can make it bigger, not too much bigger though. Anyway, in the daily news show, monkeys in central Thailand mark their day with a feast. A city in central Thailand has served a meal fit for monkeys. Yeah, so you don't mess with monkeys in Thailand. A city in central Thailand served a, f a meal fit for monkeys. Tian McLeod G from Associated Press is who wrote this article. And um, Lop Buri, Thailand has the Monkey Feast Festival. I don't know. I could probably eat any of that food too, but I'm not going to mess with a monkey. They'll take your camera and uh, take a picture of themselves. And then you don't even hold the copyright on it. They do, but they can't because they're not allowed to have copyright assigned to them because they're not human. And then it turns into a big, you know, global issue, political upheaval even as nations fight for who controls the copyright for a selfie taken by a monkey. That hasn't happened yet, but a macaque took a picture and nobody is allowed to own the copyright of it. I think that's actually going into, maybe it has gone to Supreme Court yet. I'm not sure here in the, in the US, not sure. Anyway, so amid the morning traffic, rows of monkey statues holding trays were lined up outside the compound of the ancient three pagodas. While volunteers prepare food across the road for real monkeys, the symbol of Lopburi province, around 150 kilometers north of Bangkok. And there you go. Throngs of macaques run around at times fighting with each other while crowds of visitors and locals grew. Yeah, this is a, I think this is the same setting in which uh, the photographer who basically lost their camera to a macaque. Like I said uh, moments ago, it just happens to be the same unruly group of macaque monkeys running around. Now they're taking food. Next thing it's going to be your camera, maybe your wallet, your lunch money. Anyway, the delighted onlookers were largely undeterred by the risk of petty theft, although some were content to exercise caution. Yeah. There was a month. So quote, there was a monkey on my back as I was trying to take a selfie. He grabbed the sunglasses right off my face and ran off to the top of a lamppost and was trying to eat them for a while. Yeah. You got to nail everything down. These macaques unruly group. Let's move on. Next article is over in the Hatch Ideas channel. A former Nazi encampment on a tiny channel island can be years for about $50,000. Seven acres of Nazi trenches in the Channel Islands are up for sale for about 40,000 pounds or 50,000 US dollars. The heavily fortified site was home to 24 soldiers and three Nazi officers in the Second World War and the Ch Channel Islands were the only British territory to be occupied during the conflict. Let's check these out. This might be interesting. It might be my new home. I guess it really depends. Well, it depends on if I fix the dryer or not. Apparently it's going a little wonky, so I better fix it. Otherwise I'm going to have to go and buy a tiny channel, channel, tiny channel Island. That's hard to say really fast. Tiny channel Island. Stephanie Stacy over at businessinsider.com is the author of this. It says seven acres of Nazi trenches in the Channel Islands are for sale for about 50,000 US dollars. It's heavily fortified. And um, it, I'm kind of amazed by that, that it was even taken at all. Uh, but anyway, British, it was a British territory that was occupied during the conflict. I want to see more pictures of it. So it has uh, two bunkers in the Alderney encampment were part of Hitler's Atlantic wall strategy. Per the listing, the property offers an amazing opportunity to own seven acres of World War II history. It also got superb sea views. <laughs> I can imagine it's, well, it's 
Captain Island, right? A representative of a state agency, Bell & Co., told The Telegraph. The site known as Gifoin, I guess, is that pronounced properly? Um, is open to the public and Bell & Co.'s director, Andrew Eagleston, hopes it stays that way. It would be a terrible shame if someone were to buy it and then start padlocking it. And the property will be sold by sealed bid with the offers being accepted until December 9th. And several people have expressed interest. Well, if it's supposed to start at 50,000, I don't know. I'll bid two bucks. And if nobody wants it, then I'll get it for two bucks. It's a sealed bid. So I'll have to go and look at it to see if there's actually any uh, floor for that bid. Anyway, the next article is uh, Air India has ordered its cabin crew to dye their gray hair, report says, and Air India uh, policy has set a new regulation regarding the appearance of its ca cabin crew. One rule states that, quote, crew with deep receding hairline must keep a clean shaved bald look, end quote. And the airline has also ordered a body mass index and weight checks for staff. <laughs> Yikes. I, is that even allowed in the States? I'm not even sure if that's allowed in the States anymore. It used to be. I know that, um, but I don't know if it's allowed in the States anymore. Hmm. Uh, the India, the Indian conglomerate Tata Group uh, took over Air India in January. The new owners are turning to the appearance of the crew, uh, cabin crew as part of a bid to improve the airline service and reputation per the Hindustu, uh, Hindustan Times. Apparently, it was a 40-page booklet that was disseminated to staff after a grooming policy meeting in October. Wow. Okay, so now you got to dye your hair. Interesting though, um, here in the States, gray is actually kind of respected um, in terms of, well, you've been around long enough to turn your hair gray and you probably have some wisdom there, but apparently that might not be the, the case in Air India. Hannah Williams over at businessinsider.com is the author of this article. Let's see here. Some rules focus on cabin, cabin crew hair, especially if it indicates aging. Gray hair is not permitted. Gray hair must be regularly colored in a natural shade. Purple, here I come. It doesn't say anything about purple. Just in case you're part of the podcast listening crew, it doesn't say anything about purple hair. Fashion colors and henna are not permitted. Oh, so I can't shave my head and do a henna outline of my hairline? You know, I'm starting to feel unappreciated here, Air India. According to the Times, male members of Air India's cabin crew with receding hairlines have been told to go for a cleaner look and shave their heads. But what if I looked like a chewed up eraser under all this? This thick, thick receding hairline. Oh, this video makes me want to eat mushrooms, but I can't. We actually don't have any mushrooms in hometown. It's a horrible thing. Anyway, so crew cut is not permitted. You have to do clean shaven. That's a bummer. Wow. Male crew must be uh, must carry a shaving kit on every flight. Female staff should avoid blonde hair, high top knots and low buns. Yeah, nobody likes low buns. Let's move on. That one, I'm going to have to cut it short because it's getting really long. My jokes are getting a bit hairy. Anyway, the next article is in the Hatch Ideas channel. Parents of successful kids don't worry about screen time, experts say. They teach these three skills and set instead. I'm just going to jump right on over to it. This is an article by Melinda Wenner Moyer, who's a contributor, maybe probably the author of a book or two. Not sure, but I kind of base it off of how this is written so far. So how to evaluate media, how to draw screen boundaries and how to use screens for good. Yeah, I would probably say that those are probably better than trying to say no. Because at some point they're just 
they're gonna rebel and and try and do it anyway and why not teach them to be responsible about their uh, viewership of whatever is online so evaluate it critically think about the material is it a scam does it look like it's going to be something uh, possibly a security issue is it going to be exploitive in some way or harmful in some way teach them you know how not to be interested in watching the dumpster fire um how to draw screen boundaries if you feel you have a little too control or too little control over the screen's use you may want to establish some boundaries so minimize sleep loss minimize safety concerns minimize fights yeah you're right you just create a balance about when and what to watch and and where to watch it and whatnot and how to use screens for good and teach your kids that screens and technology are not categorically bad influences they can be tools for connection learning and growth too true yeah this is something that i actually end up talking about with people of varying age from six to sixty actually more along the lines of 10 to 80. But at any rate let's move on the next article is in the continuity report and that's all about movies um thanksgiving box office disney's strange world bombs with 18.6 million as wakanda forever repeats number one i am not surprised by this not even remotely so this is an article over at variety written by rebecca rubin and it says there's a lot to be thankful for for the uh, at the thanksgiving box office disney strange world fa- failed to entice family audiences collapsing in its debut with 11.9 million from 4,172 North American theaters over the weekend and 18.6 over the five-day holiday frame. Unbelievable. Heading into the weekend, the film was expected to earn 30 million to 40 million during the long weekend, and it just fell on its face. Strange World didn't make up ground at the international box office where it earned 9.2 million. I just, I just didn't see it. I didn't see it happening says that's a catastrophic result for Disney, which has always been considered the gold standard in animation, but the studio has stumbled in pandemic times with Lightyear, which I didn't even... uh, I watched uh, Lightyear, and I never understood why it even existed. It was such... uh, It was so contrived. It, it, It didn't create... It didn't take anything that anybody could attach to and put it into the into the movie. It, it just it just didn't have anything that anybody could really bond to. Uh, not even the characters. You know, the characters weren't even likable in a way that you would remember them. One of the few Pixar films to lose money in its theatrical run, as well as Encanto, which didn't become a viral TikTok sensation until the musical Fable landed on Disney Plus. The $180 million strange world is poised to be another money loser for Disney. We'll see. Let's see what else is in here. Um, Yeah, I'm thinking that strange world is going to be one of those ones where you just forget about it and move on. But Wakanda Forever is basically um, dominating the screens. So not... Not surprised by that. So it has a massive following. Let's move on to the next article. It's over in Mobile. Top U.S. health officials say that China's zero COVID strategy is not realistic. During an appearance on ABC's This Week, anchor Martha Raddatz asked Jia about uh, demonstrations in cities across China over the weekend protesting the strategy, which uh, seeks to isolate and eliminate every COVID-19 case leading to lockdowns for millions of residents in recent months. There was actually uprising in China recently because there was um, some people lost their lives uh, because they were in lockdown and not allowed to leave. Um, you see, it's a, it, it's not a very soft shoe. Hey, uh, could you uh, stay in your house, please? Uh, during the pandemic, we, we really need to keep everybody's safety in mind. No, 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 no. it was much more brutal than that. And, um, 
So now there is uprising in China, at least for now, who knows how long it'll last or uh, when the government comes slamming down and they will at some point, the government does uh, like there's so many people in China. I mean, are they really going to sit there and worry about a bunch of people that are uprising? And well, they can pretty much crush it and it'll be, you know, hidden rushed under the carpet a lot of people remember the history but a whole lot of people will go along to get along uh, during an appearance right so obviously it's not our strategy Josh says we don't think that's realistic certainly not realistic for the American people our strategy is build up immunity in the population by getting people vaccinated that's how you manage an incredibly contagious variant like Omicron ta-da COVID-19 cases in China have hit record levels in recent days as most of the population remains unexposed to the virus, creating new restrictions as many uh, areas in the country as places like the U.S. move away from corona mandates. Yeah, and, and people, more people get exposed and then it spreads and, and uh, you know, a bunch of people die and it's just a shame. I mean, this needs to be addressed in a more holistic manner. The deadly uh, and I didn't want to get into exactly what it what brought about the protests but some people died um, hours later crowds returned to the same street on Sunday shouting we don't want PCR tests we want freedom which yeah, if you don't <laughs> if you don't stamp out this virus if you don't get people vaccinated if you don't get protections in place even wearing a mask is beneficial. You're going to end up with a constant flow of COVID-19 related uh, illnesses and deaths and long haulers, which are even a bigger drag on everything involved. I mean, when you can't go up a flight of stairs without getting winded because you've had a virus for a week um, and you've overcome it, but it has already damaged your lungs to the point where, again, you can't take a breath without being winded. Um, yeah, it has real knock on effects. You, you need to take care of this stuff. Um, so let's move on to the next article. This is over in the mobile channel. Uh, Roman coins thought for centuries to be fakes get a fresh appraisal. Thought this one was really interesting when it was brought to me. Uh, new research suggests that gold coins, which were found in 1713 and long dismissed as forgeries, may be authentic. And um, that's what it looks like right there. This is over at NewYorkTimes.com and it's written by April Rubin. And I've always uh, loved the idea of just digging somewhere and finding Roman coins. You can find them in uh, the UK. Uh, pretty easily apparently it seems like it if you've never heard of uh, the time team go and do a, a YouTube search of time team uh, they're also over on patreon but basically there it was a TV show and then it kind of got shut down and then it was brought back it went viral and now they've got a really big uh, patreon following and YouTube following and I'm one of them so go and check out time team but in the meantime Ha. Um, this is a 1713 finding long dismissed as forgeries, but maybe authentic. And these are the Roman coins that had been buried in Transylvania for centuries. Experts believe them to be forgeries and poorly made ones at that. The coins featured the image of an otherwise unknown leader and characteristics that differed from other mid uh, third century Roman coins. But now researchers have re-examined the coins, which were in a collection at the University of Glasgow. Say they may in fact be authentic i wouldn't be surprised i mean if it's um a, a region that has a particular leader in place and um the roman hierarchy says go ahead and stamp your coins the way that you want to over there then so be it right so it says the design on the coin was irregular for the time period and the man depicted on them, Sponsian, was mostly lost to history. The coins included references to bungled legends and historically mixed motifs. So let's see. I want to see. 
The name Sponsian would not have been an obvious choice for Forger centuries later, as he was an obscure figure the research team found. It hoped the research might bring him back into focus as a major histor or a minor historical figure. On the coin, he's depicted as wearing a crown like those worn by emperors. Well, that's kind of dangerous. Um, nothing's known about him for certain, except for the coins themselves, provenance records, a few other things. It was Harius, an inspector of metals for the Imperial Collection in Vienna, who documented the acquisition of the coins in 1713. So... Our evidence suggests he ruled Roman, I think it's Dacia, an isolated gold mining outpost at a time when the empire was beset by civil wars and borderlands were overrun by plundering invaders. So, yeah, he probably, if he was in charge of his own mining outpost, gold mining in particular, he probably stamped his own company coin. and got some local respect for doing so. Pretty neat. Um, let's see. So the article, it says, the research was published on Wednesday in the journal. Uh, it's PLOS1, posited that the coins and Sponsian, the man depicted, deserved another look. Pretty neat. So this is the... Uh, next article here is in the Hatch Ideas channel. Sausage dogs could have been made to fight bears in the Colosseum of ancient Rome, archaeologists said. The remains of sausage dogs were found in the 2,000-year-old drains of the Colosseum. Archaeologists said that they might have been made to fight bears or perform acrobatics in ancient Rome. And they found the bones of lions, bears, ostriches were also found along with the remnants of spectator snacks. So, packs of sausage dogs might have been made to fight larger animals like bears and perform acrobatics. Dun, dun, dun. So they, this is a Business Insider article. Aliyah Shoab is the, I think is how you pronounce her last name, um, has this picture of a dachshund. So it, it was sausage dogs um, fighting in the Roman Colosseum. So it's a heavily Roman day today. I'm not sure why. Um, I'm just kind of roaming around hometown looking at stuff. You might be interested in roaming around as well. So go check out hometown.com. But this article here, it says that uh, archaeologists have said that they found the remains of small dogs similar to dachshunds for the first time while excavating the drains in the iconic 2000 year old amphitheater, according to a Telegraph report. I can't imagine them actually fighting uh, something like a bear. Let's see. The dogs would have been ancestors of sausage dogs rather than true dachshunds, the paper noted. The modern dachshund breed emerged in early 18th century uh, Germany and was developed to go down holes and hunt badgers. Badgers? We don't need no stinking badgers. Uh, they were... Bred to be independent hunter of dangerous prey. They can be brave to the point of rashness. Yeah, we, um, I, I took in, well, the way that it worked was I showed up at work one day and somebody I could hear barking from a car and I looked inside, it's a hot day and I see a dachshund. And so I went inside and told, uh, somebody to announce over the PA system, Hey, whoever has the dog in their car, come to the front counter and um sure enough somebody shows up and i'm like hey you know you have a dog in your car um you can either take it home or i'll smash your window and take it home um and uh they said that they had purchased it for their girlfriend because they were having a rough patch and she didn't want it and they broke up and so they said if you want it you can have it so i actually ended up taking it home and uh, then we found it a forever home. So um, just a little bit of a dachshund side story there. Um, they are cute. And uh, this was a little toy one too. So pretty neat and very brave and eight uh, wires before I could 
puppy proof the house so anyway i guess they will take on anything if they'll take on cords from a light so they also discovered more than 50 bronze coins from the late roman period and a silver coin to commemorate the rule of the emperor marcus aurelius that is from the movie gladiator but a real person from that period um anyway pretty neat maybe marcus aurelius aurelius had a uh, dachshund following him around Let's move on to the final article for today. I thought this one was really interested when it was presented to me as well. This is in the continuity report and I didn't know about this um, until today. Owners of Bob Dylan's machine signed art prints will get refunds in return for sending back certificates of authenticity. The UK gallery that sold a lion's share of the prints from Bob Dylan's paintings, Castle Galleries, has issued a statement offering full refunds for customers who bought the quote unquote hand signed items that have been revealed to have actually been machine autographed. They'll get to keep the prints, but will apparently have to send back the certificates. Um, back in the day, yo, um, we used to get magazines and magazines that didn't sell through. We would actually strip the covers off and that would invalidate the the contents of the uh of the work right like we would actually strip the cover off and and suddenly all of that information no longer is valid that's much like this uh, certificate of authenticity and they're they're art prints they're not original works so stripping it of a uh, authenticity pretty much give me my money back and i will probably just burn this for crying out loud um maybe it's great work but a certificate of authenticity the worst part of this is that they were telling people that they were authentically signed human signed but it was machine signed chris willman over at variety is the author of this article and it's kind of like uh, the Volkswagen thing, you know, oh, we got caught very regretful. Let's let's fix this. And the way they fix it is just to refund the money. But it was a fraud perpetrated, right? That's what it sounds like to me. Has issued a statement offering full refunds for customers who bought quote unquote hand signed items that have been revealed to have been machine autographed. I would question everything that this UK gallery has done. I would want to audit it, you know, like when a, when a, a police officer does something unethical, they do an audit of everything. This is similar to that. I would question everything now. So the gallery's uh, Sunday morning post announcing the refunds followed Dylan's own post of regret on Friday night. In a highly uncharacteristic public statement, he said that he began using reproduction signatures on artwork in 2019 at a time when he was being afflicted by vertigo and continued using the process during the pandemic due to not being able to have staff assist him with signings, having been assured. His statement added that his team was working with galleries as well as his book publisher to find a way to redress the issue. Yeah, don't promise that they're hand signed. You know, I'm sure if people would appreciate it if it was uh, machine signed and it was stated as such, but that's not really what happened. In its Sunday statement, Castle Galleries avowed that it had no prior knowledge that supposedly hand signed prints, which typically sell on its site for 5,000 to 15,000 pounds were anything other than as advertised. Fascinating. So let's call it lack of communication, right? A failure to communicate. The statement continues. We were entirely unaware of auto pen on these prints. Nevertheless, we sincerely apologize for this very regrettable situation and want to make matters right. In order to rectify the situation, we are offering a full refund to all clients who purchase the prints in question directly from us. 
clients will be invited to keep their artwork, although we will be asked to exchange the, or you will be asked to exchange the current certificate of authenticity for one reflecting the auto pen signature. Yeah. So they're going to, uh, reduce in price, I'm sure dramatically, or they're going to go up because there are a limited number of items that went from being hand signed to auto signed and you get a, a an alternate. Uh, I think it's pretty interesting. So maybe they'll actually stay as valued, but I guess we'll see. So who will shoulder the cost of the refunds on the books and art prints? Well, for now, it's still a mystery. If the 900 copy edition of the philosophy of modern songbook sold out, Simon and Schuster would have to uh, be on the hook for more than $500,000 in refunds. Wow. Okay. That's that's astonishing. So if you have this, anything that's uh, signed by Bob Dylan since 2019, you might want to get it investigated. I'd be questioning everything. That's me. I trust but verify. At any rate, that's it for today's hometown daily news show. I went through 10 articles in 40 minutes. I think that's pretty good. Not much soapboxing because there wasn't really much soapboxing there, but a little bit of context. I hope you dug it. If you are interested in this kind of stuff, stick around. Uh, be sure to follow me here on Twitch. You can go over to YouTube as well. There's the podcast. I have a Patreon, but I've not really done anything with it. There's a lot going on. So stick around. I'll be here tomorrow, 6 p.m. Eastern. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye.